When a body is discovered, one of the first pieces of evidence investigators want to uncover is their victim's name. But what happens when this isn't possible? Much of the case hinges on identifying the victim and the people in their lives. Without this vital information, many cases can quickly fall cold for years, maybe even decades. Number 5 Quiet, shy, and reserved are words used to describe 32-year-old Brandy Renee Hanna of Charleston, South Carolina. Brandy preferred to keep her circle small and spent time building genuine connections with friends and family. In early 2005, Brandy started a new job as a waitress. And while things seemed perfect to the outside world, Brandy's life was about to be shattered. Weeks after a stunning revelation rocked Brandy, she would disappear under what investigators have marked as suspicious circumstances. Brandy was born on November 16, 1972 to Donna Parent in Charleston, South Carolina. It doesn't appear that Brandy's father was in the picture, leaving Donna to raise Brandy and her two brothers alone. Donna described Brandy as a shy child who cautiously approached friendships. Brandy preferred to make strong connections with a small group of people than have many surface-level relationships. In 1990, Brandy graduated from high school with little else being known about her early life. In 1999, Brandy started a relationship with Michael Ray McAdams. For six years, their relationship held firm, and many thought that they would be able to stand the test of time. Unfortunately, things don't always work out the way we would like them to. In early 2005, Brandy left Michael for another man, Garland Zeke Langford. This breakup was a punch in the gut for Michael, and Zeke was his close friend. Zeke had been living with them briefly after leaving his wife and children. While living together, Brandy and Zeke had gotten close and started a romantic relationship. In April of 2005, just weeks after breaking things off with Michael, Brandy and Zeke moved out together to an apartment on Florida Avenue. The apartment suited Brandy as it was close to the restaurant where she'd picked up a job as a waitress a month earlier. Brandy's mother, Donna, also worked at the restaurant as a manager, and the mother and daughter grew closer than ever. Brandy soon discovered that there was trouble in paradise. In May of 2005, a month after the two had moved in together, Zeke left Brandy, telling her he was returning to his estranged wife and children. The breakup took a toll on Brandy, and she chose to remain at the 3300 Florida Avenue apartment alone, covering the rent and bills on her waitress's salary. Brandy persevered through the pain of the breakup and put on a brave face at work every day. She kept in regular contact with her mother, Donna, who was there to support her daughter every step of the way. By May 20th, 2005, the dark fog over Brandy was beginning to lift, and she started to return to her usual self. That morning, she made the short walk to work and clocked in for a busy day. At 3 p.m., Brandy left work, grabbing a ride with a friend. According to Donna, Brandy's mother, she spoke to her daughter at around 5.50 p.m. that afternoon, marking the last time the two would speak. Donna would try and call her daughter again later that evening, but received no response. Over the coming days, Donna's maternal instincts began screaming that something was wrong. Around May 23rd of 2005, she learned Brandy had missed her 7 a.m. shifts at work and knew something was amiss. She had repeatedly tried to call her daughter, but received no answer. According to Donna, Brandy was never without her phone, and it was an extension of her hand. Donna contacted the North Charleston Police Department in an attempt to report her daughter missing. Unfortunately, the police showed little interest in the case, telling Donna she would need to wait at least 24 hours. Knowing something was seriously wrong, Donna called Zeke, Brandy's ex-boyfriend, and began requesting he let her into the apartment. When the pair arrived, the door was locked, with Zeke using his key. Inside, there were no immediate signs of distress or a struggle. A cold cup of tea sat on the living room table, and a blanket had been folded over the cushions. As reported by the Charlie Project, Brandy's clothes, money, and one of her phones were found in the apartment, but there was no sign of her. Brandy had a prepaid phone and another phone, and the reasons behind her having two phones have never been made clear. The missing phone had long been turned off, and Donna's calls went straight to voicemail. On May 27th, seven days since she had last been seen, 
the North Charleston Police Department agreed to investigate her disappearance. Through phone records, investigators were able to track Brandy's final movements. Between 8 p.m. and 10.19 p.m. on May 20th, Brandy exchanged text messages with several friends. One friend had agreed to arrive at her apartment at 10.30 p.m. that evening to go shopping. When the friend arrived, they received no answer at the door. In a last-ditch attempt to contact Brandy, her friend called her phone and heard it ringing inside the apartment. Hearing this, the friend assumed Brandy had fallen asleep and left the apartment complex. Zeke Langford and Michael McAdams were naturally the investigators' first suspects. Both men provided an alibi at the time for the evening that Brandy had disappeared, although an air of suspicion still lay over the men. Investigators postulated that Brandy had briefly stepped out of her apartment with every intention of returning. A customer at the restaurant where Brandy worked later told investigators that on the day she disappeared, she received a troubling call at work on the restaurant's phone. Brandy refused to tell the customer who had called her, but she divulged that she was scared of someone and felt someone was out to get her. Brandy's phone records later showed that one of her last messages was sent to none other than Zeke, just after 10 p.m. on May 20, 2005. Initially, Zeke told investigators he had been at work that evening, but in 2016, his story changed. During the further interviews conducted by the North Charleston Police Department, Zeke admitted that he may have gone to Brandy's apartment that evening and may have spent time with her. One of Brandy's neighbors would later come forward, saying they saw Brandy get into a red truck. Both Michael and Zeke drove red trucks, the Post and Courier also reported in 2016 that Zeke had texted Brandy several times on the morning of May 21st, but it doesn't appear that he received a response. Shortly after this startling revelation, Zeke was charged with obstruction of justice. In 2018, he pleaded guilty and received two years in prison with a two-year probationary period. Zeke was later convicted of first-degree sexual misconduct relating to an incident that had taken place several years earlier. He's currently being held in the Allendale Correctional Institution in Fairfax, South Carolina, where he's serving a 17-year sentence. He's eligible for release in 2033. Zeke still maintains his innocence and refuses to cooperate with the investigation further. Brandy's family believes Zeke is behind her disappearance and that he or someone else holds the key to unlocking this mystery. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Tamara DeCenzo of the North Charleston Police Department at 843-740-2800, quoting case number 2005-019398. Number 4. 27-year-old Joseph Schuyler Burnley, who went by Sky, was known as a loving and caring young woman. While Sky hadn't always been on the right path, by 2016, he was on the road to recovery. Sky regularly cared for his grandmother, and the two shared a special relationship. Things were looking up for Sky in 2016. That was until one muggy June evening. That night, something truly bizarre would take place and investigators are still trying to piece the puzzle together. Sky Burnley of Rankin County, Mississippi, was known to locals as a kind and polite young man. Much of the area where Sky resided was rural, creating a very close-knit community. Sky would always greet people as he passed them and held elders in high regard. He had been entrusted with the care of his grandmother, with whom he also lived, but things for Sky hadn't always been so stable. According to some sources, Skye had battled with addiction issues in the past and also had served time in prison. By 2016, Skye was looking to put his past problems behind him and was in active recovery, although the company he kept may not have been. June 2nd and into the early morning hours of June 3rd, 2016 would mark the final days of Skyler Burnley. Skye's disappearance would raise many questions, including whether Skye had really reformed after all. On June 2nd, 2016, Sky spent the evening with his friend Travis Brewer and his partner Amanda Morris at their home off of Greenfield Road in Rankin County. Sometime that evening, Sky called his grandmother to tell her he wouldn't be home until the following day. When the day broke on June 3rd, 2016, Travis was infuriated when he opened the curtains. His beloved truck had been stolen from the driveway. 
Travis, Amanda, their daughter, and Skye immediately mobilized and got into Travis's black sedan to begin the search. Travis had left his phone in the truck, and thanks to some apps and a few calls to his mobile provider, Travis was able to trace the phone to a wooded area in Brandon, Rankin County. CCTV cameras captured Skye's final movements at a gas station close to the Brewer home. Travis Brewer confirmed that they had stopped at the gas station for snacks before driving to Brandon. Travis followed the app, driving into the town of Brandon and down a secluded dirt or gravel road. Once they were close, the four disembarked, with Travis agreeing to go one way and Skye another. Amanda and their daughter stayed in the car in the wooded area. Not long after entering the woods, Travis cheered in delight. He had found his truck and rushed back to Amanda to tell her the good news. The pair planned their route home and waited for Skyler, but he never showed up. Hours passed and there was still no sign of Skyler. Travis and Amanda had retrieved the truck and driven around the woods but found no sign of their friend. Skyler's grandmother awaited his return but he never came home. It was shortly after midnight on June 4th, 2016 that Travis called 911, but the contents of the call differed from what you might expect. According to WLBT, Travis spoke mainly about his stolen truck, mentioning his missing friend as an afterthought. The Rankin County Sheriff's Office released part of the call transcript in which Travis said, quote, me and my buddy go over there to see if we could find the truck. He walked off to one side of the road. That was about 10 this morning. I walked off to the other side of the road and he's been gone ever since. I ain't been able to find him. I've been everywhere looking for him and I can't find him. Shortly after making that 911 call, Travis drove to Skye's uncle's home and left a handwritten note on his windshield. In pencil scribblings, Travis wrote, Travis, Skye's friend, he's missing. I'm worried something bad has happened. Skye's uncle retrieved the note early that same morning and called the numbers left on the note. Travis answered the call and according to Skye's uncle, he seemed blaze about the entire situation. Travis offered to help Skye's uncle search the woods with him, to which he replied it would be better to call the police. Travis skirted around the idea so much that Skye's uncle terminated the call and contacted the Rankin County Sheriff's Office himself. Hours later, the search for Skye Burnley was officially underway. The Sheriff's Department deployed dozens of officers and volunteers who combed every inch of the area where Travis claimed to have last seen Skye. Rumors began to swirl and the Rankin County Sheriff's Office caught wind of whisperings that substances had possibly played a part in Skye's disappearance. On the day he disappeared, it was rumored that he, Travis, Amanda, and another man, Matthew McCoy, were smoking together. The actual version of events remains a mystery, but some time later, Matthew McCoy stole Travis Brewer's prize truck. McCoy's testimony to the police would later shatter everything they thought they knew about Skye's disappearance. McCoy admitted to taking the truck, but also admitted to something else. He told investigators that he had thrown Travis's phone out of the window and into a yard near Travis's home. When investigators searched the area, they found the very phone Travis claimed to have tracked the day that Sky disappeared. It's been speculated that the phone was there the entire time. So how did Travis track a phone that was beside his house? According to Undersheriff Raymond Duke, both Travis Brewer and Amanda Morris showed deception on their polygraph tests although the validity of these tests cannot be assured. While Travis Brewer and Amanda Morris were picked up on narcotics charges, they've never formally been charged in Skye's disappearance. The Rankin County Sheriff's Office uncovered another alarming clue during their investigation. While in prison, Skye joined a prison gang, the Simon City Royals, as a means of survival. After being released, he was working hard to disassociate himself with the group and possibly even turned informant. The Rankin County Sheriff's Office believes someone in the gang may have discovered this, leading to his eventual disappearance. Travis Brewer and Amanda Morris continue to maintain their innocence, although many in the community now believe that Skye's disappearance was a direct result of gang orders. Only three people know what happened that muggy June morning in 2016 and one of them is likely no longer with us. It may take time and hard investigative work to get to the bottom of what happened to Sky Burnley. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Bacon of the Rankin County Sheriff's Department at 601-825-1480. 
recording case number 16060243. Number 3 Las Vegas, Nevada, America's Playground For decades, downtown Las Vegas has been home to some of the most grandiose casinos and bars imaginable. For many, Las Vegas is a dream holiday destination, with many visualizing themselves at the poker table of the MGM Grand. But not everything is as it seems. Like Hollywood, Las Vegas is an idea, not a place. Hundreds flock to the city, hoping to make it big in the poker world, only to have everything stripped from them. In 1979, Las Vegas would be faced with another such case of a person who had everything taken from them, including their name. At around 9 p.m. on August 14, 1979, Las Vegas residents walking past the El Rancho car park located on Las Vegas Boulevard South and Sahara Avenue, across from the Sahara Hotel, noticed a mass lying on the floor. The residents rushed to the vacant lot to see what it was. As they drew closer, they realized they'd come across the remains of a young woman with several puncture wounds to the abdomen. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department arrived at the scene minutes later and opened their investigation. A small crowd of onlookers gathered as the woman's body was photographed before being placed into an ambulance. Investigators at the scene spoke to several witnesses who recalled seeing the woman with the man earlier that afternoon. The man was described as around 28 years old, white, 5'11", 165 pounds, with brown hair and a mustache. The pair were last seen near a liquor store, and this lead initially seemed promising. Tracking the mysterious man down proved harder than anticipated, and all leads quickly fizzled out. The Clark County Coroner's Office was tasked with completing her autopsy, and the results would garner widespread police attention. The woman was noted as being white, 15 to 25 years old, with brown wavy hair, brown eyes, 5 foot 6 and 103 pounds. Her nails were well manicured, with red or pink polish coating her fingers and toenails. She'd been deceased from 3 to 24 hours before being discovered. As is customary, the Clark County Coroner's Office ran a series of toxicology tests and screenings. The tests revealed that the woman had a blood alcohol content of 0.238, which is high and would have caused legal intoxication. For context, a BAC of 0.37 or 0.4 can cause a person to pass away. No other substances were found. Whoever disposed of her had partially disrobed her, but there were no signs of physical assault. According to reports, she was found wearing blue Levi hip hugger jeans, a light blue-green button-up linen shirt with embroidered red flowers and sequins and no shoes. She also wore several items of distinctive jewelry, the first being a white gold ring on her right hand, along with two white gold necklaces. One of the necklaces had a small silver cutout leaf pendant with a turquoise stone, and the other had a white gold chain and clear plastic heart pendant. As per the Doe Network, her clothing and jewelry gave investigators a spark of hope, but it wouldn't be these items that she would become famous for. In the report, the coroner's office noted that the woman had no natural teeth and wore upper and lower dentures. The lower denture had never been found, and a forensic odontologist found the dentures, made from a pink plastic, had been fitted shortly before her passing. At such a young age, investigators pinned their hopes on a dentist or family member, remembering this niche detail. Despite a plethora of clues, the case went cold, and the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department took to calling her Sahara Sue. As the years went by, those at the LVMPD never forgot about Sahara Sue, or the person who took everything away from her. In 2015, the case was reignited when a pollen sample from her clothes was tested. Initially, investigators believed Sahara Sue, or at least her clothes, had originated from Florida. The pollen tests showed that she'd spent time in Central Valley or Napa Valley, California in the months before her passing. In 2016, the LVMPD made another advance in Sahara Sue's case. This time, they revealed that they had uncovered a possible name, Shauna. Investigators told the public that Shauna likely worked at a Holiday Inn or another motel along Las Vegas Boulevard. They also said they believed she'd lived at an East Lake Meadow trailer park. Investigators have not commented on how these leads came to be. In 2013, Sahara Sue was exhumed and a DNA sample was obtained. 
Per the Doe Network, mitochondrial and nuclear DNA have been obtained, and a full STR profile is available. No possible matches have been found as of yet, but several exclusions have been made. Investigators continue to pursue her case and hope that DNA advancements may bring her home. Anyone with information is asked to contact Felicia Borla of the Clark County Coroner's Office at 702-455-3210, quoting case number 7900968, or Detective D. Culver of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department at 702-828-3111 quoting case number 7953885. Number 2 June 3, 1995, Oslo, Norway. A security guard at the Oslo Plaza Hotel, a sprawling complex with over 30 floors, was sent to room 2805 to check on guest Jennifer Fairgate. Jennifer had not been seen in the hotel for several days and had ignored several requests to vacate the room and pay for her stay. When the guard arrived, he prepared himself for a disgruntled or perhaps violent encounter, but what he encountered would be far more bizarre. The guard first tried the door, but naturally it was locked from the inside. When his first plan failed, he knocked on the door and asked Jennifer to come out. A single shot rang out moments later, and the hallway fell silent. The security guard ran down the hallway towards the front desk. For 15 minutes, room 2805 remained unguarded. Almost an hour later, the Oslo Police Department arrived and none of them were ready for what lay inside room 2805. When the door to the room was opened, investigators were greeted with the body of Jennifer Fairgate on the bed. A single shot appeared to have been self-inflicted to her head, but there were immediate red flags. The Browning 9mm had been fired not once, but twice, and the weapon was upside down in Jennifer's hand. Investigators searched the room looking for anything they could use to prove the woman's identity, but they found nothing. In the room, Oslo police found a bottle of men's aftershave, black shirts, bras, and other clothing items. Bizarrely, all of the tags had been removed from the clothing. The room was elegant, considering Jennifer had stayed there for two or three days. Investigators failed to locate her passport or ID card in the room. Front desk staff at the Oslo Plaza told the police that on June 3rd, they'd sent notices to the room's TV screen, asking them to vacate and pay. Several notices were sent, and someone replied okay each time. After combing through records, investigators found what they believed to be their big break, the woman's name. On May 31, 1995, 21-year-old Jennifer Fairgate checked into the five-star Oslo Plaza for a two-night stay. She gave her date of birth as August 23, 1973, and her address as Belgium. But when Oslo officials checked with their Belgian counterparts, the address she provided didn't exist. Not once, but twice, Jennifer misspelt her last name as Fergate instead of Fairgate while completing the hotel paperwork. The company she claimed to have worked for, Serbes, located in Belgium, also didn't exist. Jennifer didn't check in alone either. With her was a man who signed his name as Lois Fairgate, again making the same spelling error of Fergate. The man was described as white, 25 to 40 years old, with dark hair. When investigators entered the room, there was no trace of this Lois Fergate. A bottle of men's aftershave was found in the room, but it's never been confirmed to whom it belonged. Investigators questioned the hotel's maids as they had cleaned room 2805 during Jennifer's stay. The maids commented that the room was extraordinarily tidy, and it felt as though nobody was staying in the room at all. The belongings Jennifer had brought with her had been neatly stored away, and the only sign of life was a pair of brightly colored high heels that had never been recovered. On June 3rd, the Do Not Disturb sign was placed on the door of room 2805 before the incident. The Oslo police's inability to uncover the true identity of Jennifer troubled them deeply. Both key cards had been found inside the hotel room, and it had been locked from the inside when they arrived. Why was this woman prepared to go to such great lengths to conceal her identity, and what really happened to her? Hotel phone records revealed Jennifer had tried to call two numbers, both of which were tied to Belgium, while at the Oslo Plaza. Both of these numbers were invalid, so who was she trying to call? Those who had stayed on the same floor as Jennifer recalled that she was polite and courteous during their exchanges, and spoke both English and German fluently. 
One patron even commented that they believed Jennifer may have been from East Germany, giving her language proficiency, syntax, and accent. Rumors have swirled in the years after Jennifer's passing, and her case has even garnered its own subreddit. Many believe Jennifer may have been a spy or working for a secret governmental organization. She and her partner went to great lengths to conceal their identities, even in the final eventuality of her passing. The possible East Germany connection has only added fuel to the fire of her being a spy. Some also believe Jennifer Fairgate may be connected to the elusive Isdal woman, found in Norway in November of 1970. Much like Jennifer, the Isdal woman's identity had been carefully concealed and she remains unidentified to this day. In 2016, Jennifer Fairgate was exhumed from her grave and a sample of her DNA was obtained. Investigators were surprised to learn Jennifer was older than 21, putting the age estimate between 25 and 35 years old. No ID was provided upon check-in, and investigators have been unable to confirm her age. Hours after Jennifer was discovered, the mysterious Mr. F came into the picture. Mr. F had stayed across the hall from Jennifer in room 2804. He was questioned shortly after Jennifer was discovered, telling investigators he checked out on the morning of the 3rd. During this early morning checkout, he was informed of Jennifer's passing in room 2805. Jennifer Fairgate's body was not discovered until the evening of June 3, 1995. So how did Mr. F know about her passing in advance? Did Mr. F jumble the details in his brain or does he know more than he's letting on? Jennifer's identity and what happened in room 2805 continues to elude investigators. Rumors and theories are abundant with some believing Jennifer was part of an assassination network. Anyone with information is asked to contact journalist Lars Wegner of the VG newspaper at 4722-000306 or jennifer at vg.no. Number 1 29-year-old Selena Marie Eden was once known as a bright and outgoing young woman, but all of that changed in 1989 in a freak accident. In the blink of an eye, Selena's life changed forever. A year after her accident, Selena seemed to be on the road to recovery and eventually moved back into her own place. Just months after returning, Selena's mind snapped. One phone call later, Selena would be gone. Born March 17, 1962, Selena Marie Eden was a bright and outgoing young woman. In 1980, she graduated high school in San Diego and pondered the path before her. Selena had been in the student body and was heavily involved in extracurricular activities at school. Her grades were always high and she was well liked by her peers. After trying out college for a few semesters, Selena changed paths, enrolling in the United States Air Force. Here, Selena flourished under the strict routine of the Air Force and she made solid friendships. Several years later, Selena left the Air Force and pursued another dream of hers, to be a San Francisco resident. According to Clarissa Eden, Selena's mother, she found work on construction sites and also joined the infamous Teamsters Union. Clarissa was incredibly proud of her daughter's achievements and usually supported her daughter's goals aside from one. Shortly after arriving in San Francisco, Selena purchased a motorbike, which naturally made her mother anxious. Clarissa was right to be nervous, and on November 29, 1989, Selena would be involved in a near-fatal collision. Selena had been unable to stop as a truck had pulled in front of her, throwing her from her bike into the air and then onto the pavement. For seven days, Selena remained in a San Francisco hospital as a Jane Doe until her family and the police finally tracked her down. When Selena's family heard she was lying in a San Francisco hospital bed, they made the 500-mile drive in haste. Doctors informed Selena's family that she'd suffered permanent brain and eye damage. For six weeks, Selena remained in a coma, and when she finally came around, things were hazy. Her thigh had also been crushed, and Selena's world had been overtaken by agonizing pain and confusion. Selena still knew who her family members were, but other memories were not so easy for her to recall. Clarissa Eden later told investigators that the accident and subsequent coma had stolen Selena's personality. In one interview, she described Selena as a child again, one who depended on their caregiver for their every need. For several weeks after she awoke from a coma, Selena remained in the hospital where she underwent radical physical therapy, along with speech and brain therapy. 
Doctors told her family she would require extensive rehabilitative therapy, indefinitely, and that she would have to learn to walk again. Selena's siblings described her as determined and sometimes stubborn. She was determined to return to her usual self as fast as possible. To aid in her recovery, Selena moved in with her mother, Clarissa, in San Diego following her discharge from the hospital in January of 1990. Selena's siblings visited her almost every day, and shortly after her discharge, they began to voice their concerns. After her accident, Selena had been afflicted with blinding headaches and extreme confusion. These bouts of confusion would be met with rage and frustration from Selena, who thought she was progressing well. Her personality changed, and her sunny disposition had been replaced with a mean-spirited person. Clarissa did her best to help her daughter, but the more she brought up Selena's confusion and memory loss, the angrier she became. In May of 1990, Selena made the 500-mile move back to San Francisco again. In Selena's eyes, the move was a great success, and she was happy to be around her friends, but her family were more worried than ever. Her behavior became more erratic, and they felt she was not ready to be alone. In October of 1990, Clarissa received what would become the final phone call from her daughter. During the call, Selena told her mother she'd met someone who had promised to be kind to her, and she would be going away for a while. When pressed, Selena refused to tell her mother who this mysterious person was, and was very evasive, which was out of character. Clarissa remembers hearing her daughter say, don't worry if you don't hear from me in a month or two, I'll be calling you soon, before the line went dead. Clarissa Eden desperately tried to contact her daughter, but all attempts were futile. Selena's friends told her mother that they noticed her behavior had dramatically changed in the days before her disappearance, and that she seemed to be in a hurry. Clarissa eventually hired a private investigator, but there were so few leads that the investigation was closed months later. On December 31, 1991, Laurie Gallagher, Selena's friend, received a disturbing voicemail. In the clip, Laurie described Selena's speech as garble. The contents of the message have never been released, and it's unknown whether investigators were able to trace the location of this call. The entire nature of the San Francisco Police Department's involvement is also unknown, and we don't know the exact date Selena was reported missing. Unfortunately, Laurie Gallagher and three of Selena's sisters have since passed away without ever knowing what happened to her. Anyone with information is asked to contact Police Sergeant Mark Mitchinson of the San Francisco Police Department at 415-553-0123, quoting case number 921-367-343. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.